yes, welcome to your uh, fourth session. So this is your session. Session four will be your next session, which is on sampling methods. Before you get here, um, I would like you to make some notes on sampling methods and prepare yourself for um, everything that sampling methods involve. So you're doing your AO1, which is your description of sampling methods, and AO2, AO3, which is your evaluation of sample methods in this video. Um, you will be conducting sampling, not quite in the way you imagined, so it won't necessarily be on humans, but there will be some sampling method conduction happening, conducting happening. Um, so please make sure you're comfortable with these step-by-step -step guides because one of the first things I'll ask you to do in session, I'll say, right, get into groups and plan this method of sampling. Okay, but first what I'd like you to do is check your evaluation answers for your lab study, uh, lab field natural quasi against the ones on the video here. So they don't have to be perfectly identical, but I just want you to get a bit of a feel for what the structuring should look like. My expectation would be that you would be able to be a bit closer to structuring them effectively the next time you come to class. So lab experiments. I've got a weakness of a lab experiment is that it's low in mundane realism. You state it much like we did um, with the TB um, programs in uh, your last lesson. A weakness is that uh, it's low in mundane realism. They need to tell me why this is a weakness and this is where you access the higher points. If I'm in class, well, if I ask you why is this a weakness and I'm constantly asking you for more and more and more, the reason I'm doing that is because this sentence is what gets you. It makes the difference between um, getting a lower grade and getting one of the higher grades because it's where you really show off your knowledge and um, particularly if you're wanting to go into the second year. So if I'm asking you, then you should think about it carefully because it means you're not elaborating enough, but also think that I'm preparing you for the second year, so you want to work with me to do that as effectively as possible. So we've got this is a weakness because it means that the participants will act less naturally, increasing demand characteristics and decreasing internal validity. Because because demand characteristics is a type of extraneous variable, we can't be confident of cause and effect and therefore increases the internal validity. If you mentioned any of that, great. The other things you can talk about with high mundane realism is that it's low in ecological validity and therefore the results can't be applied to the real world. But you must have a really detailed sentence there. You can't just say, um, therefore it can't be generalised. No parks, not enough. The strength of labs is highly controlled. This is a strength because it means extraneous variables can be controlled for increasing confidence in cause and effect and therefore internal validity. Um, and a strength of the lab is it's easy to replicate. This is a strength that allows us to check for reliability. This is one of the most important things that I will tell you in this um, video, apart from all the other information, <laughs> which is that you cannot be, you replicate to check reliability. Just because you can repeat an experiment doesn't make it reliable. What does make it reliable is if you repeat it and get the same results. So when you replicate something it is just to check for reliability. Okay. Next one, field experiment. And the eagle-eyed amongst you might notice that how I'm trying to keep life easier, especially as we move on to the quasi and to the natural, because obviously they're very similar to quasi to lab, natural to field. So this is to make your life easier. A strength of a field experiment is that it's high in high mundane realism. This is a strength because this means that the participants will act more naturally. This will reduce demand characteristics and increase internal validity. So hopefully you've all spotted what we've done there. Not a huge amount different. You could talk about extraneous variables, anything like that. It is not a problem. You will never ever or very unlikely be asked in the same question um, to evaluate field in a different way to lab. They always bounce each other off each other. Lab and field are completely opposite. Quasi and natural are completely opposite. So uh, in various different ways. So you can always evaluate them. A weakness of a field is it lacks controls. So that can increase extraneous variables. And then this is a weakness because we cannot be confident of cause and effect and therefore it reduces internal validity. If you are not talking about reliability or vi internal validity in your P-structure, then you um, are not doing it quite to the full extent. Okay. And then a weakness of the field is it's difficult to replicate. This is a weakness as it makes it difficult to check for reliability. And there you go. Nothing particularly special there. Please just check the structure. On your A3 sheets, I don't mind if you only structure one point. So if you have one strength for lab that is in a P structure, one weakness for lab that's in a P structure, and then underneath you've bullet pointed the other two, I just want you to practice structuring these. Um, at using the P structure. Same with field, you can have one P point and then some bullet points underneath for short ones and one P weakness for um, field and so on. Okay. Then we have quasi experiments. A weakness of a quasi, it's low in high mundane realism. Excuse me, I'm just going to change that. 
much better now. So it is low in mundane realism. This is a weakness because it means that the participants will act less naturally, increasing demand characteristics and decreasing internal validity. Uh, another weakness of uh, oh, let's see if it's a weakness. Another point for the quasi experiment is that a strength is it's easy to replicate. Replicate because like labs, labs are similar to uh, quasi experiments and their ability to replicate, and it also allows us to check for reliability, um, which you know. So check for reliability. The strength of quasi is highly controlled. So again, it's like a lab. So extraneous variables, increased confidence, cause and effect, internal validity, etc., etc., etc. So they're very, very similar. Um, Another weakness of quasi-experiments is we cannot randomly allocate participants. So quasi you'll expect to see this one in quasi and then expect to see this one in natural. And this is really one that's very useful if you can to try and understand it. The so weaknesses, we cannot randomly allocate participants. At the moment, the way you've put that is just a statement. So that's why we do this as a weakness or weakness because. So that says this is almost like a description, isn't it? We cannot randomly allocate participants. That could be both a description or an evaluation. To turn it definitely into evaluation, you must make it clear. So it's a weakness because we cannot control for founding confounding variables such as participant variables and I've used exa loads of examples all the time with this so it might not the on it might not be that the only reason so um, you can't randomly allocate so they come in so they're both left one's left-handed and one's right-handed or the groups are left-handed and right-handed the conditions and uh, but that's not the only difference that's the uh, consistent systematically different between the two so uh, all left-handed people have possibly always experienced um, have it only having being able to use right-handed scissors for example it's a weak example but there's not always left-handed scissors available however all right-handed people chances are if you've got two scissors there are always right-handed scissors available so the left-handed people have had experiences using um, equipment designed for right-handed people and right-handed people haven't for left-handed people as you know confounding variable does it happen all in one condition and not in the other condition if that's the case then it's confounding if it happens at random then it is extraneous okay luckily you've got loads of other definitions so if you really struggle with that one don't worry if you're accessing the higher marks you really will need to be able to talk about confounding variables really impress the examiner natural experiment a strength is it's high in mundane realism which we've already talked about a weakness is um, that it lacks control so we've talked about that within fields a strength is that we're able to study situations that would not be possible for psychologists to replicate ethically or recreate ethically so this is strength that allows us to study situations we otherwise would not be able to allowing us to back theories with empirical evidence or empirical methods so empirical Empirical method is a term from the second year, so if you wanted to go into second year, if you want to be a very high achieving student, then you want to make a mental note or even just quick note in your booklets about uh, empirical methods. It just means, empirical just means direct observation and experience, E for empirical, E for experience. So lab and lab studies or any experimental method, natural field quasi, and um, observations allow empirical support, empirical evidence, are empirical methods, and they back up theories. So they allow us to be more confident to test theories to see if they work. And obviously you can't do that, for example, if you were looking at the difference between um, something quite uh, difficult like the um, people who've experienced, um, so looking at the, the earthquakes, nat nat um, the earthquakes, and people who have experienced those, um, you can't have a theory about trauma of earthquakes uh, and then go, right, someone's going to experience an earthquake and then we're going to test it, we're going to make them experience it. You have to back up those theories by waiting for those events to happen and then drawing information from them. So that helps us do that. And of course, we talked about randomly allocating participants. So you can't do that. So again, there's a problem with confounding variables. Those last two don't necessarily have to panic about as much, but just see what you can remember. Again, bullet point as many as you want and then it's the p paragraph the one at the top that you need to be able you need to have at least one sentence so if i had said to you in class right lab studies what was the uh, um, pee or the pe the point example structure uh, sorry point explain structure that you used you'd be able to read one or tell me one okay right sampling volunteer opportunity random systematic stratified you need to be able to describe them and you're going to start to evaluate them as well but the first is a couple of pieces of terminology you need to know the target population is and this is really important to remember everybody that you want to apply the results to everybody in the target population is everybody you want to apply the results to so for example if i wanted to know um out of West Knox College, what was their uh, West Knox College as favourite? Because they did this once in the canteen. What was their favourite sausage? They did the, f the sausage testing to decide on the sausage and the bacon cobs whether the right kind of they had the right kind of uh, 
bacon and sausage. They tested uh, the target population because I want to apply it to everybody in West Knotts College was West Knotts, uh, West Knotts College students. The sample was a small number of people, so not everybody went and, tra and taste tested them and then rated the bacon sandwiches, uh, the bacon sandwiches, the sausage cobs on um, their taste, whatever, their, fla their favour. So the target population is everyone you want to apply the results to and the sample is physically the people that you get your hands on and I have some examples here that are probably much better than the sausage cop one. So students studying A level, A levels experience higher levels of stress measured by adrenaline and neuroadrenaline um, in the blood in September than in May. So who is who do we want to apply the whole, all the results to? So every single person in this population should apply the results to. In this case, there are 300,000 A-level students per year in the UK, so that would be our target population. Next one would be, um, we want to conduct some research uh, or s test the hypothesis. Singles mothers aged between 20 to 30 experience more, um, experience score more highly on a depression self-rating scale than single mothers 40 to 50. So who is the target population? Who do we want to apply our results to? Uh, lone parents. So I've put single mothers there but actually really it should be lone parents shouldn't it? Because of course uh, either a mother or a father can be a single parent. There are two million lone parents in the UK so we want to apply our results to lone parents or at least lone parents between 20 and 50. So that's the target population. Our sample, perhaps we only managed to get um, 15 sing uh, single parents or lone parents between, uh, between 20 and 30 and maybe 20 lone parents, 40 to 50. So that was our sample there. Um, pregnant women metabolise more milligrams of vitamin C towards the end of their pregnancy than at the beginning. Who do we want to apply those results to? Well, of course, all pregnant women. So, of course, you can assume that um, roughly that many women were pregnant um, that year so that's how bit what our target sample is that is who we want to apply the it to and maybe our results were maybe we went down to Kings Mill and we asked around in the maternity ward there or we tested their metabolism of vitamin C um, so our sample was only perhaps 100 people but the target population is everyone we want to apply the results to now there is an activity in your flip learning book if I can have a really quick go at that can you identify just like we've done here the target populations and I will ask you all I'll go around and ask in class that information so we'll find that out Okay. Um, representative sample, bias sample and generalise are all really key terms that you need to be aware of. A representative sample is a sample that accurately reflects our target population. So if our target population was everyone in the UK and our, own, and our sample was only made up of white men, then quite clearly that is not a representative sample. Because as you can see here on the ethnic breakdown, there are lots of different people who are identified with different races. Um, we haven't looked at gender, but of course, as you all know, there isn't, it's not, uh, the UK isn't just made up of men or in fact women. If it was an all-female sample, that wouldn't be representative either. So if you're going to have a representative sample of the UK, ideally about 86% of the sample would be white. Uh, and then there'll be other various, and you can see all the various different ethnic breakdowns that hopefully would be in there as well. So that would be a representative sample. The same with uh, in A-levels, if, if I wanted to apply my research to the whole of A-levels and I took um, psychology students and asked them about I don't know, satisfaction rating or whatever, that would not be a representative sample because as much as it shocks me to think this is the case, there are other subjects and other students um, that don't f don't study psychology and so and then all the other things so every, every time I've gone that's not a representative sample of course it's a biased sample so if it was we wanted to apply it to everybody in the UK and it was only it was purely white it would be a biased sample towards white people the same as if um, we wanted to apply it to the whole of the UK and they were all um, everyone in the sample was Indian it's a bias sample. There's so it, um, and the same with if we wanted to apply it to the whole human race and our sample was entirely female or our sample was entirely male, it would be biased. If the sample is representative, we can generalise the results. If the sample is biased, then we cannot generalise the results. And so there, it's really important that you remember that only the word, re the, represent the word representative only applies to the sample and the word generalizable only replies to the results. Remember that and you'll have find your evaluation points that you do dead, dead easy. So uh, if you have a representative sample, you can generalise the results to the target population. If you have a biased sample, you cannot generalise the results to the target population. Or you cannot be as confident when you do because of course you never can or can't do anything. You just It's on a sliding scale. 
volunteer bias so that's another word that you need to consider and it is something that we can we will talk about you'll be able to use it in your evaluations volunteer bias refers to a specific bias that can occur when subjects who volunteer to participate in a research project are different in some way from the general population is the fancy kind of official definition um if you're not sure you can follow that link and it will take and if you search the word voluntary response samples it tells you a little bit more information in there so click on the find button don't scroll through click on the find button type in that phrase and it will find it for you it is basically the idea that people who volunteer if you're asking for volunteers you will always get a certain type of person and depending on the study and various other things that will always depend on um what that certain type of person is and so isn't one particular person but a good example would be um, generally you would expect that the kind of person who is, prepared, is able to um, volunteer for a study probably has more time so potentially is either unemployed or retired so you're missing out people who work um, generally volunteer samples people are more helpful and more opinionated so you get someone who it might look like everyone is very uh, the youth are very very passionate about I don't know something really stereotypical like politics uh, but actually that's because they volunteered so you've got a really passionate sample whereas if you went out and sought people out they'd be like yeah I don't really care and then sampling frame. So a sampling frame is a complete list of all the members of the target population. So you will see why that's important in a minute. And the sampling frame is quite a fancy official term that you can use. Okay. Some reminders. Uh, population validity. So of course, if a sample is not representative of the target population, it lacks population validity. So we can't be confident of. Um, that we can't confidently apply the results to the target population. So if it's high in population validity, the sample is very similar to the target population. If it's low in population validity, the sample is biased. And of course, you've got investigator effect or investigator bias. So that's when the behavior of the investigator, either consciously or unconsciously, influences the results um, of the experiment. And both of those, you'll see why I've just reminded you of those in a minute. So opportunity sampling. Here you've got... Um, some examples of people doing opportunity sampling. The one on the left is particularly one I always think of when I think of opportunity sampling. So that market research where can I just uh, have you got two minutes to take uh, to complete a questionnaire, okay? And opportunity sampling is whoever is available at the time. And it's really important. In a minute, I'll tell you another type of sampling that you should not get opportunity sampling confused with. Opportunity sampling is whoever is available at the time. Uh, and a really good example, like I said, market research. Uh, another one will be psych students at a psychologist's place of work. For example, you find this all the time. Loads of, stud uh, loads of studies are conducted on uh, undergraduate psychologist and that's because lots of research happens at universities and psychologists are lazy and they just use whoever's available so ah, I'm teaching this person this week I will ask them to take part in a study uh, and finally a really good example here there was I don't know if you remember but the elect when we had the elections there were huge shocks um, or maybe it was a referendum I think it was the election there was big shocks because um, of who was successful and that was because they'd um, they'd done a survey the kind of generally surveys kind of give you an indication because you say would you mind volunteering the information to would you mind telling me who you're going to vote for um, and that gives us an idea of popularity uh, and I've probably explained that for the politics students you're going that is not what it is at all but that's a really basic idea of what it is so you, you might be able to explain it better the reason there was a problem apparently with the election was because they used, relied on telephone surveys so they just took whoever was available whoever answered the telephone and of course, the argument was that most people, young people now, um, and I use the term young quite lightly because a lot of people, um, up to probably possibly even 40, don't ha don't use telephones. They don't answer the telephone. They're not at home during the day, and they don't necessarily have landlines. Lots of people use mobiles, so um, they got a very skewed, biased. Um, sample because it's mostly people who are home in the day and elderly people who did vote a certain way. Volunteer sampling then is the next one. So again these are the two simplest ones. Psychologists put an advert in a newspaper asking for participants and there you will see public announcement and it's also one that's in 270 on the uh, board the, bin, the board that's pinned up. Uh, we will pay you four dollars for one hour of your time which is very generous of course uh, and that is a very famous Milgram's ex um, experiment. Okay. However, we did talk about volunteer bias, so that is something that we could uh, consider now. People who volunteer for things are more likely to, uh, because they're volunteers, you will end up automatically end up with a, a bias sample. So, for example, Milgram, he advertised and he found that people were very obedient and the suggestion was that people were more obedient because they were a volunteer sample. They followed the instructions based in the, uh, the advert. They read it and they were more likely to follow it, whereas someone who was a bit more disobedient, who um, was a bit more nonconformist, didn't answer the, wouldn't follow the the instructions didn't answer the um, advert. 
another one that's possible a possible suggestion and this isn't these are just kind of general ideas it might not necessarily be the case is that um you generally end up with volunteers who are more educated or have a higher social class because they can afford to take time off so it's that same idea of volunteer sample yes i would like to take part in that piece of research in the middle of the day uh, on a work on a monday uh, and most people are at work most people are um can afford to take that time off or you could be more educated because students have a lot more flexible time I won't say free time because of course you're doing lots of studying but there are t periods of time within the day when you would be available and then there's an example of Hazen and Shavers um, they do a love quiz where they um, and you'll look at this much more in attachment so it's the idea that the attachment type you have when you're a child is um, oh maybe yes no you do look at this with Andy is similar to the attachment type you have with your romantic partner when you're older um, and they, so they got people to fill in a questionnaire to say, and they'd work out what their attachment type was as a child from their memories. And then um, they would also get them to, they asked them, again, it was advertised in a newspaper to fill in the questionnaire about how happy they were in their current relationship. If you're currently in a really horrible, rubbish relationship, are you going to say, oh, I'd love to do this piece, this questionnaire on um, uh, uh, relationships and how terrible my relationship is? No, of course not. So they only ended up with people very happy relationships which skewed the results as well and of course volunteers are more keen more helpful more keen so they're particularly passionate about the piece of research that they that's being studied hence why they volunteered for it systematic sampling so I'm ramping up the difficulty opportunity is the easiest then we've got volunteer and finally systematic you get a list of the target population or you create a sampling frame which is every single person from the tar target population you then select the nth term which just means as I'm sure you all know, just any term, you pick one at random. So example here in the picture below, they're sampling every third person. Or you could do a random generator and you could end up with, uh, it could be every 15th or every 42nd or every, every second, who knows. And then you select that number person from the list on the target population. So you would have, say, 20 people and if it's every uh, second number, you go 2, 4, 6, 8 and so on and so on, as you can see here. Okay. Random sampling. This is the one to not get uh, confused with opportunity sampling. Random sampling, you get a list of the target population. You choose a, r a method of random selection and you'll have a look at different ones. It could be names out of a hat, it could be a computer generator. This is different both to opportunity sampling and random allocation. Random sampling is how you collect your sample. Random allocation is um, how once you've got your sample, how do you put them into conditions? So random sampling is collecting your sample. We've not got anybody get your sample. Random allocation is, oh, I've got my sample already. That could be collected through volunteers, systematic, any of those. Now I'm going to randomly allocate them to conditions. Please do not confuse those two. And then select the appropriate number of participants using this method. And then you'll see below there's a couple of different examples. You could use computer selection, so that's a random generator. And it's given an example of children, so each children's name is given a number, and a random generator is used to produce the sample size. Um, so it would generate, for example, 100 uh, participants' uh, names, or you could talk about giving them a number, but you don't have to. They could literally just randomly uh, generate the names. Or manual selection. So, um, and then it's very, very detailed. It's much easier to talk about computer selection, and also nobody would do a manual selection. It's far too complex. So you get a list of everyone from the target population. Think about how many, was it two million lone parents? You're not going to have a, a massive hat that holds two, mil two million names. Um, the researchers put each name on a separate slip and places them all in a container and selects 100 slips from the container. You can use it, it's a bit rubbish. So uh, the following conditions, things you could talk about, they should be shaken every time to keep it completely at random, otherwise the people right at the bottom, if you don't shake it every time, they've got the, it's not random because they're less likely to be chosen, um, any of those things. And there's also something called a random sampling uh, number table, which you can have a read of as well. If you want to pause and have a quick look at those, then you can do. You don't need to know any of those uh, the key one that you, you just need to know one of the methods so computer selection is the easiest one okay stratified sampling then this is the one that's a little bit more complex but you'll all still be absolutely fine with it get a list of the target population so that's a sampling frame identify strata from the target population so that just means different categories different ways that people can be categorized so gender age race um, it all depends on what's relevant really um, wages, uh, so socioeconomic status, any of those things. So any strata, any sections of society. So identify the ones that you want. 
work, work out the proportions and then randomly select the sample from the strata. So that sounds very, very complicated, but basically what you do is you get a list of the target population and you go, I want them to be representative based on age, gender um, and race. Then you need to work out what percentage of the target population is made up of that certain characteristic. And then you need to work out, and this is where the proportion cost start bit comes in, you need to work out um, how many you would need in your sample, so to make sure the percentages match, and that's it. So here you've got all of the target population, and then you split them into strata, so blue, red, green, maybe, the colours. And you need to make sure that your sample, the proportions are the same. So in the, stra in the target population, the largest number of people are blue people. So in the, ran in the sample, the, ni the largest number of people is uh, blue people as well. And then the slightly less orange and slightly less green in the target population. So in your sample, the slightly less orange and the slightly less green. And this you need to randomly select. So don't panic if you're completely thrown by the, those sampling methods. Don't worry. But if you're not, you need to randomly select the sam the the sample. So you need to do that. There's computer generating methods and stuff, but just think about that if you're the higher level. So an example would be if your target population was the UK, and then there are 65 million people uh, doing a bit of rounding, possibly the wrong way. 65 million people uh, in the UK. So that's your target population is 65 million people. However, your sample is going to be 100 people. So you've identified all of your target population. Now what you need to do is identify the strata that you're interested in. So I've just gone with male and female to keep it simple. I've worked out that 49% of the UK's target population, the target population of the UK is 49% are male and 51% are female. So I've worked out that in my sample of 100, dead simple maths, 49 of my uh, participants need to be male and 49 need to be female. And I randomly select those um, 49 from the target population and the 51 from the target population as well. The same with if it was a sample of 200, 49% uh, 49 of 200 um, is 89 and 51% is 102. Same with um, the target population again is um, oh. ah that was to make it easier. We've all worked it out anyway with that. So just to uh, just to really reinforce my point, here is the same slide a second time. <laughs> um, so it is about you need to work out what percentage is in the target population. And then you need to make sure that you get that number of people to represent that percentage in the um, sample. We will go over that in class, but please do try and understand it and please email me if you're not sure. Final thing we're going to look at is we're going to start the note taking process on evaluation. You don't have to do it in lots of detail. What I would like you to do is consider representativeness. So I want you to think about what sam what, um, which of the methods would collect the most representative and the least representative sample. So in terms of your booklet, what I'd want you to do is just make a brief note of that. So obviously, if you think it could be a very representative sample, then it would be um, then it would be a strength. If you think it wouldn't be a very representative sample or be in danger of not being a representative sample, then it would be a weakness. I am going to ask you at the start of class or at some point during the session next week to, um, or it might be this week if you've done it after the weekend, uh, place the sampling methods in order. So you're going to rank them on representativeness and so on. So you might want to think about it like that as well. But really all I need is some brief notes. The same with investigator bias. Which ones remove the opportunity for investigator bias as much as possible? So we've talked about it a lot. They might very carefully select their sample. They want to see that men are better than women at maths ability then, and they want to guarantee that's the results they'll find. They go and select their men. If it's an opportunity sample, oh well I'll just go and select my men from um, the maths department to university and I'll select my women from, um, I don't know, a level two maths class because you can guarantee they've got a certain level of uh, mathematical ability or vice versa you could do it the other way so you could select women if you wanted to demonstrate that uh, women have better spatial awareness than men you would pick women who were racing car drivers <laughs> and you would randomly sample men who were um, I don't know I can't think of it anywhere somewhere that people would congregate where they don't have spatial awareness who knows? So you could carefully p uh, select it that way as well. So which one of those sampling methods allows you to, or which 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 number of them, which couple of them allow you to allow investigator bi investigator bias to happen? And uh, thinking the other way, 
um, where does it stop it? Where can it not be possible? So where there's no opportunity or very little opportunity for the investigator to cause any bias. And then easy, ease of conduction. So e easy to conduct, probably a better way of saying it, if it's easy to conduct. Um, psychologists are naturally quite lazy people. So which one would be the easiest? Is that the best in other ways? Probably not. It's prob if the easiest one's probably the least representative and the most likely to have investigator bias and so on. So at some point in the lesson next week, I will ask you to place those on a scale. So you want if you want to prepare, you can have a think about that. But the key things you've got to do is make a note. So is it easy to conduct? Is it hard to conduct? Does it allow for investigator bias? Does it not? Is it represent? Does it develop a representative sample or does it not? And that is it. Thank you very much.